Okay, yes, today, since you're joining us today again, but we also have some extra people, which is really great to see. Um, Nedim will, of course, introduce our speaker today, but I just want to say that the topic of uh, school climate and culture is so important for all of us throughout our network of education policy centers, and I think that is the reason why we have the interest beyond the project. Um, so I think all of us can learn uh, today and and i hope that we have uh, a good day just to go quickly through the agenda so we have first a lecture from 10 to 11 then a short break then we go back into the uh, more details of how we do what we would do with climate and culture together with yasna and nedim uh, and then in the afternoon we have a workshop on values so same kind of schedule like yesterday we finished by 3 30 in the afternoon right nedim right over right, from uh, here. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the NEPS and Arise Summer School. I have a privilege for today to share with you one of our persons from uh, Center of Educational Initiative Step by Step, uh, Mrs. Jasna Kovacevic, which is uh, our board member. Uh, she's a professor at the uh, University of Sarajevo, Faculty of Economics. Uh, she teaches management and organization, and I am happy to share this brilliant mind with people around the region. Jasna, in following hours, will speak with you about the school climate and culture and also how to set up the mission and vision of the school and what are the steps to do so to be authentic, organic and to have some sense, not just to be uh, on, on a paper. So I want to say good morning, first of all, to, to Jasna and thank you very much for taking your time to be with us in this summer school. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. And I would like to thank both Nadim and Lana for inviting me uh, to give lecture to, to today's summer school. So I think this is a great opportunity to talk about very important issues in education. And these issues are particularly burning issues in terms of COVID and the pandemic and what we have been challenging uh, in the past year, year and a half. So um, I think this topic will open up a lot of questions so we can discuss throughout the lecture in the first session and also during the session two. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, discussing with you all of the important aspects of inclusive culture and climate. Thank you, Yasna, very much. I would just kindly ask you if you can just speak a little bit slower because we okay. have interp interpretation in Turkish so we can help Kaihan not to die today. <laughs> It was, I, I, I think it was uh, heavily burned yesterday, so I uh, hope Kaihan will catch up to, today. Just, uh, and also if, if Kaihan and Turkish team need some, need some time or have some comment, please say so, so we can arrange some uh, different tempo and dynamic of the, of, of the lecture and the, and the workshop. Hopefully everything will go okay. Again, gods of internet hope will serve us for, for today. And now I will uh, leave you in the hands of Jasna Kovacevic for the first lecture of, of today. Thank you, Nedim. Uh, I will share my screen. Hopefully the technology will go hand in hand with us. Uh, please signal if you can see my um, slides. Okay, great. So the topic for today is inclusive school culture and climate. Just to give you a brief background of my research and teaching interest, uh, because I'm from School of Economics and Business, people often ask me, what are you doing in the education and why are you talking about school cultures and climate? A um, long time ago, I decided that I cannot focus on, on businesses and that a school and in general, schools in general, um, educational institutions are very interesting and very complex organizations that can provide us with insights how to manage the educational system, which is a complex system as well, uh, in order to make a society a better place to live in, just society and also society that provides uh, opportunities for everyone. So this is a short overview, why am I here today and why am I in the field of uh, school leadership and school management? So. The agenda for today, as Nedim and Lana also mentioned, in that we will in the first session talk about the inclusive <clears throat> school culture and climate. <clears throat> sorry. And the, first of all, we will talk about the achievement gap trap 
that relates to LOSAS students and the environments in which LOSAS students are gaining their knowledge. Apart from that, I will focus on intrinsic, institutional, and preceptual predetermination. Uh, just to get to the matter of things, why do low-cess students underachieve in contrast to students who are uh, from the mid-range uh, SAS or high socioeconomic status? And we will discuss about teachers as possible agents of change in school, but also we will reflect on teachers as agents of inclusion. And we will try to decipher and give an answer to a question whether we as teachers are part of the problem or part of the solution, because in very uh, large proportion of educational systems, including the system and systems in Bosnia and Herzegovina, teachers are part of the problem, unfortunately. And at the end of the first session, we will discuss about the changing school and how to introduce the inclusive school culture and climate, which is really not an easy task, but it can be done. And we will discuss about the necessary steps and necessary environment and necessary factors that need to be present in schools in order to create inclusive environments. After that, we will have a brief Q&A uh, session, a uh, brief break, and then uh, in the second part of uh, today's lecture, we will discuss about mission and vision that goes aligned with inclusive values in schools, and my colleague Nedim uh, will help me during this uh, part too. Now, I wanted to quote somebody who has really made an impact on our lives and on the way that we have been socialized into the social system. And I think Nelson Mandela is a great example. Um, Nelson Mandela, we all know the story about Nelson Mandela and the challenges that he faced and the change that he brought to uh, South Africa. But what he said about education is that uh, it is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. But we have to understand that change can go both ways. It could go in a positive direction, but also it can go uh, into a negative direction. So the education and the educational policy can in fact go in both ways. And we will discuss about the positives and the negatives of the change and how to use the education to change the world into a better and more just place that is based on social, uh, social values and social equality. Now, what is the reality in fact? Uh, first of all, we need to delineate different terms that are related to equality, equity, and justice. And uh, the reality within our educational systems is that usually one group of students, privileged students, are getting more than they, more than they need. Uh, while other students who are uh, from underprivileged groups and minority groups are getting less than they need. So in terms of the achievement gap, there is a consistent uh, huge disparity between students, for example, from high socioeconomic status who have educated parents and on the contrast, students who are from low uh, SES families and uh, from backgrounds with low uh, educational levels. On the other hand, the equality uh, is related to the assumption that everyone in the educational system and in the society as a whole is getting the benefits uh, that they uh, receive from the same supports. And this is considered to be equal. However, we must make a distinction between equality and equity because equity is uh, the situation where everyone gets the support they really need that produces the equity. So uh, there is a difference between equality and equity being the equality, the assumption that everyone will benefit from the same position uh, if they're placed in the same position. But we all know from the classrooms that we are teaching and, and we know from everyday situations that this is not the case. And what is justice ultimately? On this picture, you can see that um, the systemic barrier has been removed so that we are addressing issues of equity and equality at the same time. Now, educational system is abundant with uh, systemic barriers, especially for students, minority students, for example, students that come from low SES families. And throughout this lecture today, we will try to decipher all these different structural aspects that exist in school, schools, but also in our perceptions about uh, students that are underachievers and students, especially uh, with low SES background. Now, um, throughout this lecture, I would also like you to think about following questions. Uh, these can in fact be rhetorical questions, but I hope that by the end of this lecture, we will try to find answers to these questions. Now, these are the questions that are related to what we really want students to learn. 
what are those skills, what are the knowledge, knowledge and information that they need uh, to process in order to be successful in life? Uh, how do we know if they're really learned? Uh, what do we do if we notice that they do not learn? How do we behave when we understand that they have learned? Now, these are the four questions that I want you uh, to think about uh, during this lecture because they are very important for uh, the next part of the session. Now, to go to the focus of the matter, uh, we have to define what the achievement gap trap. First of all, the achievement gap uh, is the buzzword. Uh, it doesn't matter how well developed the educational system is. The achievement gap is the phenomenon that persists. And if we look at the uh, definition of the achievement gap uh, throughout the literature, uh, we can see that this is basically a persistent disparity on the different educational measures between the performance of uh, various groups of students, especially the focus uh, when we're talking about the achievement gap is uh, on gender, for example, race and ethnicity, uh, language difficulties, disabilities, and socioeconomic status. So the majority of studies that are dealing with the achievement gap are actually addressing the dis huge disparities that exist between students who are privileged and underprivileged in, relations, in relation to these factors such as gender, race, language, disability, and socioeconomic status. Um, the practice has shown and the international assessments and studies have shown that basically the achievement gap can be uh, observed through various measures. And from the educational system to educational uh, system, the measures are differing. For example, somewhere in, in one educational system, the uh, measure of achievement gap is measured through test scores, for example, PISA results, TIMS results, PERLS results. Uh, in other educational systems, uh, people are focusing on grade point average or dropout rates when they're trying to measure the achievement gap, et cetera, et cetera. So there are different um, measures for achievement gap, but the ultimate message of the achievement gap is uh, that there is a dis difference between students who uh, have been fortunate enough to have access to necessary resources to advance their knowledge and skills. Now, um, you can notice that I'm actually today talking about the achievement gap trap. And the achievement gap trap is uh, our own belief that socioeconomic status is very strong, important factor that influences the student achievement, especially uh, the, the achievement of low SES students. Now, sociology of education uh, has been uh, familiarized with the achievement gap for a really long time. And uh, throughout uh, the, the past decades, the achievement gap, especially the one that relates to socioeconomic status have been, has been systematically documented in a wide range of countries from those who have uh, been developing countries to developed countries etc. So um, there was one particularly interesting study, recent study from 2019, international study that has observed the indices of the achievement gap in 100 countries all over the world in the period from 1964 to 2015. And this study, international study, has shown that achievement gaps have increased in a majority of sample countries, both developed countries and also developing countries. And uh, what is really interesting is that the largest increases are observed in those countries with rapid, rapidly increasing uh, school enrollments from uh, pre-education, kindergarten education, but also in primary and throughout secondary uh, education, implying basically that uh, expanding access Work. reveals the educational inequality that exists in each and every society, uh, which was previously hidden outside the school system. It was buried uh, under the surface, but when uh, children are brought into the educational systems, uh, these inequalities actually yeah. appear. And uh, what is really Im important to mention is that uh, a lot of authors are trying to question the achievement gap and trying to answer the question whether we are talking about the vicious uh, circle and trying to answer the question, is the achievement gap uh, the consequence of a poor system or is the poor system actually a factor that contributes to the achievement gap? Doesn't matter if the children are coming from low SES or high SES families. And one of the very interesting authors to which I'm referring to today is Stuart Yeh, 
who says that the uh, prevailing emphasis on socioeconomic factors, uh, or for example, sociocultural influences and teacher quality is actually a misconception. And he says that um, the cause of the gap may in fact then be traced to the systemic flaw in the school system in, in schools as very complex organizations. And uh, this author presents his theory that basically schools present learning tasks and award grades in flawed way that basically undermine the self-efficacy of students and their engagement, motivation, causing low performing and uh, to even broad all these differences. Hi, everybody. Somebody has their mic on. Can you turn it off? Because we have a few sounds. Somebody, I think it's the Macedonian team. Says that basically uh, schools are characterized by conditions that are known. Oh, gosh. Seems we have some technical issues. We'll give it a, a break. I'm sure it will be sorted out soon. Mm, I will, I, I, yeah, Yasna is back. Yasna is back. I'm back again. Yes, there was also somebody who had their mic on while, we, while Yasna was speaking so we could hear background noise. Please make sure that you turn off your, uh, your mics while Yasna is speaking. Thank you. I hope everything is fine and that you can see my presentation. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. okay. You. So um, uh, let's continue uh, from the slide on. Uh, so basically what the contemporary authors are trying to, to say to every one of us who are uh, in the educational system is that we need to reconsider uh, the, the position of the achievement gap and try to ask ourselves questions whether our schools are uh, the, the cause of the problem and teacher as well, because um, schools are characterized uh, by conditions that are known to elicit so-called learned helplessness. Now, learned helplessness is a term from positive psychology, and the term has been coined by Professor Martin Seligman, uh, who is prominent uh, a psychologist. And he, he defined a learned helplessness as a state that very often occurs uh, after a person has been experienced a very stressful uh, situation over and over again. And over the course of time, the person comes to believe that they are unable to control the situation or whether they can, cannot change the situation, so eventually they give up. Now, after students have been um, exposed to unstimulational environment, they eventually give up on their own achievement. And we will discuss about uh, the inclusive school, in schools, school climate and culture and how they can help in um, overcoming this learned helplessness problem, which is basically a, a huge part of the overall problem when we are discussing uh, inclusion and diversity in schools. Another reason that uh, it, it seems that the systemic flaw is, is what we are looking for is that differences uh, in socioeconomic status, for example, that exist prior to the age when children enter the school system do not adequately in statistical terms explain the decline and self-efficacy, motivation, and engagement of low-achieving children uh, after they enter the school system. And in addition, uh, neither school nor teacher quality can explain the persistence of the achievement gap as the study from 2019 has implied because there is a consist consistent increase of the achievement gap in developed countries. And these developed countries are heavily investing in the quality of schools and in the quality of teachers, but we are just not getting the results that we are all uh, wishing for in terms of the uh, achievement, closing the achievement gap between low student low SES students and uh, high SES students. Now, before I continue, uh, I want you to take a, a, a moment and uh, think about the, uh, the particular situation. Uh, I would like you to close your eyes and envision the situation that I will be talking to you about, okay? And then we will discuss about this particular situation. Now, 
close your eyes and try to imagine uh, this particular airport rush scenario. Now, you're uh, being late on your uh, airport, on your, uh, you're trying to catch a plane because you're going to a very important conference of educators, but over uh, abroad. And you're rushing over people, you're jumping over people and their suitcases, and you're the last person to board on, on the airport. The pilot comes out from the cockpit and he makes a very interesting uh, joke about you. Uh, being the last person to board. You're going to your seat and you're sitting next to a person that starts a conversation. And during the conversation, and the flight is very long because it's overseas, uh, overseas uh, flight, the person tells you that um, it is a neurosurgeon and that it's also uh, visiting a conference uh, overseas. The flight is very long, and after the flight, after you came to your destination, you feel very exhausted. You go to the hotel uh, to, to leave your luggage and go to a restaurant to have your dinner. And during the dinner, you notice that there is a noise in the restaurant. Uh, one uh, couple is celebrating their anniversary and they're so happy and they're so thrilled that eventually all the guests in the restaurant are joining their celebration. You're joining them for the celebration until the uh, morning hours, but you are aware that you have to go to the conference where prominent speakers will be uh, delivering speech about education and uh, very important aspects of changing the education. Okay, so I hope that you have envisioned the situation. And um, I have a few questions for you. So you can uh, switch your microphones on or maybe raise your hand if you want to answer. Um, uh, tell me, was the pilot uh, Asian? No. Okay. The person sitting next to you, neurosurgeon, was it a woman? Nope. Okay. The couple uh, that was celebrating their anniversary at the restaurant, was it a gay couple? No. And the keynote speaker delivering a speech at the educational conference, was it a black woman? No, okay, so uh, I'm not trying to play tricks on your mind, but I'm just uh, trying to um, make um, a position about the way that we have been socialized into a system and how basically the discrimination can occur both ways explicitly and implicitly. Now, implicit discrimination is very often the result of the socialization patterns. For example, if we do not see women pilots in media or uh, minority pilots in the media, then the overall picture uh, for, uh, instilled in our brain is going to be a very tall uh, and dark headed man uh, or neurosurgeon will be, for example, men because majority of neurosurgeons are in fact men. And our perception and our socialization is focused on seeing the traditional family as a union of men and a woman. So we shape our perception about the couples, the, the married couples and the uh, family as a traditional family, as a union of men and a woman. And when we are talking about keynote speakers and very important people, very important leaders in our educational domain, which is basically horizontally segregated as a female profession, we also perceive that the majority of school leaders, school principals, school administrators are in general men, uh, more men than, than women. So these are the uh, patterns of the socialization that we are susceptible to. And this is, uh, this is why I wanted you to envision all these particular aspects of the perception, because if you can remember at the beginning of the lecture, I have um, mentioned that sometimes teachers are also a part of the problem. Now, uh, this little exercise is actually telling us how we are preconditioned to think about certain people uh, and the ways our society has shaped the perception. So uh, when we are talking about the flaws in the system that are causing the achievement gap, there are a couple of inconvenient truths about being predetermined to think about someone in a certain way. In that sense, teachers can also have 
perceptual predetermination about students and about their ethnicity, for example, gender, socioeconomic status, disability, poor handwriting, speech and language pathology, et cetera. So all these problems and issues that children are facing from their communities, in fact, influence teacher perceptions. And often uh, prejudice that teachers have can significantly influence their expectation of students. Now we will go through all these three uh, predeterminations just to make sure that the flaws in the systems are um, adequately addressed. Apart from uh, teacher perception and teacher perceptual predetermination, students also have intrinsic pre predetermination. Uh, remember what I've said about learned helplessness. If children are over and over exposed to unpleasant and stressful situations in schools where do, they do not get opportunities to short, show their potentials, eventually, after many, many, many times of trying, children will give up. And the student perception of his or her probability of achieving success in schools is related to the feeling of learned helplessness. Usually messages that students receive within their environment can either build their self-confidence and their, their motivation, or uh, it can destroy it. And another predetermination that is also a part of the systemic flaw and the systemic problem that causes the achievement gap, according to Ye and many other authors that are boarding with him, is the institutional predetermination. Uh, schools, as I have mentioned, are very complex organizational systems that consist of many different rules, procedures, and norms. But the aim of these rules, norms, and, and um, many uh, different procedures is to uh, identify student proficiency or lack of it and trying to track students into groups ranging from remedial to gifted. And this is called the cognitive separation of students. Now, uh, throughout this presentation, I will go through all of these predeterminations just to make sure that we are on the same pace when we are talking about teachers as possible, pro possible part of the problem. Now, um, Basically, when we are talking about the prejudices that teachers often have, uh, these teachers' expectations can affect student achievement in primarily in two ways. One of the way is that um, studies have shown, international studies, that teachers tend to teach more material and more enthusiastically to students for whom ha they have high expectations. And this is very consistent and the statistical data is uh, really not, not so um, um, encouraging when we are talking about these expectations and how teachers teach. Another uh, expectation that affects student achievement gap is that teachers respond more favorably to students whom high expectations are held. Now, uh, remember the little exercise that we had about the airport rush and how we perceive people uh, in, a, in, in terms of our own socialization. Now, um, the experiences that we have been encountered with throughout our life, lives and perception that we as educators have before we become educational profes professor, uh, professionals can uh, impact the way that we see disadvantaged people and also disadvantaged children. If we as educators, educational professionals, uh, have developed negative opinions about uh, people from uh, minority groups in regard to many different characteristics that are related to, for example, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, we are beginning that our class with um, disadvantaged students having strikes against them. So uh, at, at the very first moment, those students are dis already disadvantaged. It doesn't have to be necessarily connected with their low uh, socioeconomic status, but ultimately this is connected to our own preconception and predetermination that we have about certain people and certain groups of people. Now, um, we have to simplify the prejudices and we have to talk about the uh, stereotypical notions. And stereotypical notions and stereotypes in general are mental schemas. And there are mental models uh, that aim to oversimplify the world. We are bombarded with many different information throughout the day, and we are trying to systematically sort these information. But oversimplified uh, schemas, which are also known as stereotypes, are usually fixed impressions and exaggerated uh, preconceived ideas and descriptions about certain people and their achievements and their um, abilities to do a certain task. 
And throughout my research uh, in, in primary and secondary schools, I have found that a lot of teachers have implicit bias against students that come from, for example, low SES families or students that are on, uh, for example, have disabilities, et cetera. The main focus for them when they get a student that has a disability is that this child cannot learn uh, on the same pace as other children. So uh, this is the first starting point that basically shapes the overall, overall interaction in the classroom, uh, including the interaction between the disadvantaged student and also uh, a teacher that has uh, preconception or predetermination about the student. Now, a part of the, another part of the problem is intrinsic predetermination that is related to the student environment from which they are coming from. And uh, we are living in a very complex world uh, that has basically three realities. One reality is that students are product of their environment, so we cannot uh, annul the situation. And um, basically no one has the ability to change the environment in which they have been brought in uh, or the ability to change their parents. Another problem, another problematic situation from the reality is that students' resistance is a product of their experiences. Now, if students have been systematically exposed to stressful situation, their uh, behavior in the classroom will become reactive. And often this reactive behavior is perceived as uh, problematic behavior, disciplinary issues, et cetera. But we are not getting to the core of problem to ask ourselves whether we are the part of the problem in that classroom with that particular, particular child. And the third problem is that um, in the primary school, but also in the secondary school, majority of children are not mature enough to understand the ramification of academic failure. So they need adult support. And this adult support is usually concentrated uh, in the teaching staff. Now, if teachers do not understand their own position and their own prejudices that they may have as a result of their own socialization in the system, then we have a problem. And then we have a systematic uh, injustice within the classroom. And then uh, this systematic injustice from the classroom spreads out uh, to the whole uh, school environment. Now, I also have to refer to parents because we have to understand that um, no other influence from the outside environment is more power powerful for children than uh, the influence of parents. Um, unfortunately, a lot of students are, uh, who are suffering from intrinsic predetermination and learned helplessness learn many uh, dysfunctional patterns, behavioral patterns from their parents. But that should not act as an excuse for teachers to do the best what they can do to uh, motivate students who are coming from low SES families to become uh, overachievers and high achievers as well. So once again, we are going back to teachers as part of the problem, not because of the quality of their um, education or the quality of the educational environment, but we are talking about these prejudices that very often teachers have. And this is, again, the definition of the learned helplessness. And I hope that you will uh, take on this particular definition uh, of this phenomenon, because it really is something that is striking uh, in schools, particularly schools that are disadvantaged, large school population so with a lot of students who are coming from disadvantaged families. And in these schools, we are uh, witnessing learned helplessness as a phenomenon, which is further broadened up and complicated with intrinsic predetermination. And finally, uh, another predetermination that is causing the systemic flaw in our schools and in educational systems is the institutional predetermination. And schools are basically um, developed as systems uh, to physically separate students by academic ability. Now, this is not, uh, this has not been done uh, explicitly, but in a more implicit manner, because the separation between students from, for example, low family, low cis families and high cis families occurs in informal ways uh, within the classroom, where, for example, some students who exhibit academic success, success tend to receive more academic praise, special praise from their teachers, uh, ultimately becoming the teacher's pets. Other students who are not achievers uh, do not receive such praise. And ultimately, when they are over and over exposed to such situation, they eventually give up from trying. So it is very, very important to understand that the educational system basically is um, in a way shaped uh, 
to follow the bell curve of meritocracy, where majority of students in schools are average performers, uh, around 70% or somewhere 80% in some, some societies, but uh, minority of students are high performers and poor performers. Now, what is the problem with the meritocracy that we are um, uh, giving boost in schools. Meritocracy, unfortunately, is the foundation for grading practices in primary and secondary education and also in higher education. It is uh, the foundation for also academic tracking throughout our academic uh, um, lifespan. It is also the foundation for norm reference testing, accountability, and also for merit pay and evaluation of teachers. So uh, what I have been um, focused on is trying to study that meritocracy as uh, evaluating student success can actually uh, is very, very flawed in terms of educational system. Maybe it's a good solution in sales, maybe it's a good solution in sports and talent competitions, but uh, meritocracy is, can be, in fact, be a huge problem in the educational system, particularly if, when we're talking about school climate and school culture. Now, um, I want to, trans, uh, to make a transition uh, and tell you something more about the school environment and actually how to develop more inclusive cultures. Now, um, in a couple of times I have mentioned that schools are very, very complex organizations and that uh, they're different from other organizations that uh, we can encounter throughout our life. They're different from ministries, they're different from uh, business organizations, they're different from other types of institutions such as hospitals or other public institutions. Now, what is really interesting about schools is that they're under influence of many different uh, factors, for example, coming from societal context, and we have political, institutional, and cultural factors. But there, there are also many different institutional uh, context factors that are related, for example, to public-private divide, size of the school, uh, centralized or decentralized uh, school decision making. And within that broad context, we also have uh, very important characteristics of school leaders. Now, when I talk about school leaders, I usually refer to both school principals and teachers, because as I have mentioned, school teachers are in fact the agents of change. They are the, those that implement inclusive practices. If we cannot uh, give sense to the uh, teachers and if we cannot uh, point out to many different problems that we have in our classrooms, then all the efforts uh, to change the school into an inclusive one are going to fail. Now, one of the very important aspects uh, within the uh, school as organization is the autonomy. And this is the question that we all need to have for ourselves. Uh, I know who I am eventually as an educational profession professional, and I know how to do my job. I knew, know how to work with children. I know how to collaborate with my colleagues. I know that I have prejudices and I'm trying to eliminate them. Now, this is a very important position for each and every school leader. Uh, another very important aspect of school life is cohesion. I know why I'm doing this and I'm doing this collectively. Now, one teacher cannot change the system, but many teachers, many good teachers, many self-aware teachers who are willing to confront their own prejudices about children, disadvantaged children can change ultimately the system. And if we have this cohesion, then the school has a, a very good standing, uh, standing ground to make a change. And uh, one of the, the last aspect that is very important is the objective. I know as a person, as a, a professional in education, where I'm going and I also know where my school is going. So these are very, very important aspects of the school context uh, that really shape the inclusive climate and culture. Now, on this slide, you can see different types of schools with relation uh, to autonomy, cohesion, and objective. Now, uh, throughout the research that I have conducted in Bosnia Herzegovina, but also international research, I have found that there are schools that uh, are struggling with poor skills, but they're ha but they're having strong will. Now, these are the schools that have no discipline, no accountability whatsoever, but people people are loving. The community is very loving. 
Uh, but the problem is there are no competences and there are no goals for these schools. And uh, one of the uh, interesting point about these schools is that we have cohesion, but people are lacking skills. They are lacking skills how to address the issues that low set students uh, are facing. We, are, we do not have competences. We do not have knowledge how to help these children to come out of the vicious circle of low SES and low, uh, achieve, uh, low achievement or underachievement. Another type of schools that uh, are existing in practice are schools that have strong skills but poor will. And I'm calling these schools Darwin Darwinian schools because in these schools we have very high standards and very high expectations uh, teachers have high expectations from students, but there is no empathy and there is no cohesion between teachers. So this, these schools are guided by the mantra that only the strongest persist. And this mantra is also present in the classroom. Now, if the strongest of the students are those who are advantaged, then we are having the problem of deepening the achievement gap of the students who are coming from disadvantaged environments. And Darwinian teachers are in fact lacking empathy and they're uh, failing to recognize their own prejudices that they have about the students who are coming from problematic backgrounds or disadvantaged backgrounds. Another type of uh, schools are the schools that have no will and uh, have no skills. Uh, to make a change in terms of bringing inclusive values and bringing the inclusion in their classrooms. And these schools are the most problematic ones. These are the schools that are basically struggling. And these are the disadvantaged schools, many disadvantaged schools that I have witnessed in the rural areas, large schools in the rural areas where majority of student population is uh, from, from disadvantaged families with a low socioeconomic status. And ultimately, uh, all schools should strive to become sco schools with strong will and strong skills. And in these schools, there are high standard present, high dedication of teaching staff. They're nurturing the common identity. They're nurturing high levels of empathy and cohesion. And uh, there is an overall sentiment that school belongs to everyone and that everyone belongs to the school because of these inclusive values and egalitarianism that is being nurtured in these schools. Now, when we're talking about teachers uh, as part of the problem or part of the solution within the inclusive uh, schools or schools that are not inclusive, we can encounter different types of, of teachers. For example, uh, in every school that I have been investigating and, and doing research and I have noticed dedicated teachers and you probably uh, are familiar with dedicated teachers. Those are the teachers that accept every change for which they believe that they can improve the performance of all students regardless of their socioeconomic status, gender, disability status, etc. Apart from them, there are also neutral or less experienced teachers, sometimes called the tweeners. And these are the new novice teachers that haven't been integrated into the school and school culture. So they're not familiarized with the principles and the norms and the values that have been promoted in the schools. And these teachers have very loose ties with other people because they're new to the collective and they, don't, they do not understand how people communicate in that school. Sometimes uh, their enthusiasm can in fact mask uh, the, the lack of their uh, professional achievement or the lack of knowledge and lack of skills. And we have the problem with these teachers as being the part of the problem because they do not know how to approach the students who are disadvantaged, disadvantaged in many different areas. Now for these uh, particular groups of, of teachers, school leaders are very important and we will see how school vision and how school missions, uh, mission are actually shaping the attitudes of students that need to be socialized into the school culture. We also have survivor teachers, and these are the teachers who have been uh, in the school collective for very long. So they're already in their comfort zones and they have given up to practice uh, the effective teaching methods. So they are just counting days to their retirement and they're just trying to survive the school year. And these 
teachers are not investing any effort to work with students who are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds. And also they have very strong uh, predetermination about uh, kids that can succeed and those who can succeed. And ultimately, um, last but not the least, a group of teachers who can be very problematic and the par part of the problem in terms of creating the inclusive school culture and cr climate are the fundamentalists. Now, fundamentalists are highly, um, highly influential teachers, very experienced, te experienced teachers who believe that their way of teaching is the only right way of teaching. I'm sure that you already have certain names in your head about uh, this category of, of teachers. And I call them social Darwinists or Darwinians because um, ultimately these teachers believe that certain groups of kids are more superior to other group of kids who are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds. And in fact, they are nurturing very toxic environment within their classroom. And this toxic environment spills over on other classrooms and also on in, in meeting, meeting rooms uh, on other teachers as well, because they're very influential. They have the power to influence other people's opinion. So uh, we are talking about fundamentalists as people who are in fact part of the problem within the school and who are heavily burdened with their predetermination about certain kids being able to achieve uh, the necessary results uh, and the kids that are not able to achieve uh, the, the student success or to raise the bar of their achievement. Now, uh, where do the, the culture and climate come in and why we are talking about inclusive climate and culture today? Because these two aspects of school life are basically uh, the guiding point. They are the guiding light uh, of the school life. So if we have toxic cultures, people will not collaborate. People will, will get into fights all the time. People will not communicate. Uh, there will be poor relationships between teachers, between teachers and students, between school administrators and teachers. So the toxic environment can actually broaden the achievement gap and can broaden the problems in a school that is struggling uh, with, with large population of disadvantaged students. Now, uh, I have to delineate uh, between climate and culture because these um, two terms often are observed as synonymous, but they are not synonymous. Uh, and I have used uh, um, an oversimplification to explain what is culture and what is climate. If we look to climate and culture from the meteorological perspective, we can say that the climate is our perception of what the weather is today. In Sarajevo today, the weather is extremely hot. It's already above 30 degrees Celsius. And it, this type of environment can be uh, quite problematic, for example. Um, but we are currently um, trying to tune our behavior towards that particular temperature. We are trying to cool ourselves down to turn off, uh, to turn on uh, the, the air condition just to make ourselves pleasant in the environment, which is, which is really unpleasant. This is the climate. The moment that we are feeling right now, how do we feel at the particular moment? And on the other hand, the culture is related, for example, uh, to the norms and the values that we are living by. And when we are uh, trying to connect the dots, uh, how are we feeling today? We know that it is summer, so we have to behave in a certain way. The norms of the continental uh, countries during the summer is that you have to uh, drink a lot of water, you have to have uh, appropriate clothing, you have to um, keep yourself from sunlight, to being too, too, too much exposed to sunlight. So these are the norms of the behavior and we know how to behave during summer, during winter, during spring and during fall. So the culture is basically shaping the norms of behavior 365 days a year, but the climate is the actual moment that we feel right now and how we feel the, uh, the, 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 the current feeling. So the culture uh, can be related to many different values and beliefs and rituals and ceremonies and also legends that together create the collective identity and personality of school. Now, culture is a more broad term 
uh, in contrast to school climate. And school climate is basically connected to the quality of human relations in schools. And on this slide, you can see that these relations are multiple. We have uh, relationships between students, between teachers, between teachers and students, administrators and students and teachers. So the overall quality of these relationships is creating the uh, school climate, how we currently feel. Do we feel pleasant? Do we feel unpleasant? Are we stressed because of the uh, poor quality of the human interaction in schools? But the school culture is related to values, common values that we all have in schools, to expectations that we have from each other in schools, to beliefs, to assumptions, to rules and norms that we uh, have in particular culture. And when we are discussing culture as a very complex social phenomenon, I have to uh, focus on two aspects of culture. Uh, some aspects of culture are visible and you can see in your own schools, uh, school vision, school mission, some schools have been defined school vision and mission. Uh, schools also have different structures. They use different symbols to send many cultural messages to all the people in the schools. Schools have common values and schools have strategy. But below the water of this culture iceberg, there are some elements of culture that are very hard to decipher, such as our own beliefs, prejudices that we have been mentioning uh, before, traditions that we instill, perceptions, all the unwritten rules that shape our interaction. And when we are discussing about changing the culture from toxic to inclusive, the reality is that the visible aspects of culture are much more easier to change. We can in fact change structures, we can change the school strategy, we can change the values. For example, in terms of inclusive school culture, we can impose diversity by delivering the procedures promoting diversity in our schools. But if we do not change our behavior uh, to make every student welcomed in the classroom, to make students feel comfortable, to make them feel self-efficient, to make them feel motivated in the classrooms, regardless of their position, regardless of their socioeconomic status, race, sexual orientation, et cetera, then we are not doing uh, any good for that school. In fact, it can be counterproductive. We have to live the inclusion. Diversity is one thing, but the inclusion really is the way that we live life in schools. Do we promote the values that we have written uh, at the entrance of our schools? Uh, do we really live the inclusion in the classroom? Uh, have we eliminated our own bias as teachers and our predetermination to believe that certain kids are just destined to achieve? Now, these are the uh, invisible aspects of, of uh, school's culture, and these are the aspects that are very difficult to change, and they cannot change if we uh, do not address uh, the problems uh, that we bring about as, as teachers. Now, when we um, talk about uh, school culture as a variable that is influenced by many different uh, factors, we can see that the national culture, for example, is influencing school culture and the way that people are behaving in schools. For example, the type of the sector, such as educational sector, the uh, culture of the entire educational system is also impacting the school culture. For example, if you have a toxic um, culture, in the entire educational system, if you have administrators and uh, decision makers that do not listen to teachers, that do not listen principals, that only have one-way communication, this toxic culture within the educational system will spill over to the schools as well. And also the school culture is shaped by the attitudes, by the knowledge and by the competences of school administrators, school principals and school uh, management teams. So if we have competent people who are open-minded, who are very open to promote egalitarian values and inclusive values, then these people are really, really important and have a power to promote these values throughout the entire collective in the schools. They have the power to influence the teachers and how teachers shape their own perception. So school teachers are under influence of school principals and other school administrators. So we have to bear in mind that school principals act as uh, also initiators of change in terms of changing the schools uh, and climates and cultures into more inclusive one. And the school cultures impact behaviors 
it, it impacts our decisions and our actions and interactions. And the behaviors also tend to impact the visible aspects of school uh, within the broader educational system, including the strategy and the control and the motivation, but also it affects the student performance as well. So if the children are growing up and acquiring knowledge in a very stimulative environment that accepts them for what they are, then those children can in fact uh, out, go outside the trap of low cess achievement and become uh, very successful individuals. In fact, research from the international context have proven that if teachers have the collective efficacy, if teachers feel competent, if teachers feel that they can address the burning issues within the classroom, then uh, this factor related to teachers has the power to influence or to even eliminate the impact of low cess on student success. Now, uh, I'm going back to my previous constatation that teachers can also be a part of the problem as well as part of the solution. And uh, the last slide for the first session is uh, related to school climate. As I have previously mentioned, the school climate is connected to the quality of human interaction. And the elements of school climate are, first of all, safety that relates to socio-emotional safety of people in schools, relates to order and discipline. How do we resolve conflict? Do we emphasize equity and equality? Uh, do we obey rules, both teachers and, and students as well? Or uh, do we have physical safety in school? Apart from safety, uh, one of the very important aspects of uh, school climate is the community. And the community is related to partnerships the school has with other actors, very important actors and stakeholders within the community in which it exists. It also relates to the quality of human relations and to the trust and to the perception of um, mutual understanding uh, within the teachers collective, but it also relates to cohesion and diversity, whether diversity is welcomed in a particular school and how do we perceive diversity as something that can uh, make the school more successful or something that is uh, actually hampering the school down. Uh, another aspect of, of the school climate is also economic, uh, academic environment that relates to previously mentioned leadership and the leadership capacity of school administrators, but also relates to teaching and learning and uh, what is the quality of teaching, uh, how uh, committed are teachers in fact, are as a result of teacher commitment student motivated, what are the expectations and what are the, our predeterminations, do we believe as teachers that all students can succeed no matter on their disadvantaged background. And also uh, what is really, really important to mention is that very uh, influential element of school climate is the professional development or professional learning communities. How do we connect? How do we learn in schools? Whether this learning occurs formally or informally, these are all very important aspects of school climate. And also uh, institutional environment is really important as an aspect of school climate. Uh, and this is very often a factor that uh, school principals and teachers cannot influence. For example, it is the physical environment, it is the heating, line maintenance, and all the resources that schools maybe have or may hey not, uh, have not, depending on the public uh, in investments in the public education, but it also is determined by the school size and also the class size and other available resources such as material resources. Uh, and the last slide for the first session is um, just to connect the dots. Uh, what are the outcomes of positive school climates? And when I say positive school climates, I primarily mean on inclusive school climates where all people feel very welcomed. And positive school climate studies have shown that people feel emotionally safe, that they uh, have very prominent self-concept and that students and teachers both have a high quality mental health. Uh, there is a low incidence of substance abuse and psychiatric issues of students. Uh, there is improved psychological well-being of adolescents, low incidence of student absenteeism and drop-off rates. There is a strong and positive effect on learning motivation in students. 
there is also something that is very important to us today, uh, elimination of negative effect of low socioeconomic status on economic achievement of students, which actually tells us that if we fix the, fix the system, we will fix the achievement gap. And in positive school climates, there is also a low incidence of bullying and violence in schools because school climate and also school culture can act as protective factors. So these are the um, main aspects that I wanted to mention about inclusive school culture and school climate. I hope all these things um, have not been that much confusing because school culture is a very complex phenomenon and hopefully you can all relate to many different aspects of inclusive schools and uh, schools and inclusive climates as well. Thank you very much, Yasna. This is, this is beautiful. I am still um, on that slide when you, told, uh, when you talked about um, different types of school climate and culture and fundamentalists. Uh, I won't stay fundamentalist this time, so I'm going to offer people, it's already 11 o'clock, but I think this is the time for, for questions uh, out of the audience that, that listen to you. Thank you, Jasna, very much. Thank you. And now we open the floor for, for the participants to, to ask. Luckily, we will have one, one more session with Jasna, so uh, we can bring some 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 ideas and questions to the next session. But before we move on, I would like to open the floor. Yes, now can I just ask you to close this uh, so that we see everybody, it might be easier. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, thank you so much. Perfect. So here we are. Um, yes, so many things we've heard today. Um, would anybody like to comment or see how this is connected to what we're trying to do either in this project, Arise, or other projects that we're doing? Uh, and what does it actually, when we understand this, what does it mean? So we have Tiana with her hand up. Tiana, go ahead. Hi, hello. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Yasna uh, for a wonderful presentation, really inspiring and uh, thoroughly and meticulously prepared. <laughs> Um, it was really, really useful to see all the references as well. I, I appreciate that really much. Uh, first of all, I was just I, I wanted to uh, make a note. Let's say, uh, like when we move uh, the perspective uh, from which we uh, look at school climate and school change, consequently, uh, th this presentation really uh, makes me think um, that it is even harder to do that than maybe I thought before the presentation. Like this moved the perspective to the broader culture, the uh, society in general, and how all the, the how all the uh, teachers, schools, leaders, students are socialized uh, into um, specific identities, let's say, and, and, and uh, how they acquired uh, patterns uh, uh, in their thinking, practices, etc., etc. So this really brings me to think of uh, uh, school change as even bigger challenge than before. Just, just a, a mental note and thanks again for, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Tiana. Uh, this is the reality. Sometimes we have the tendency to oversimplify the issues within the educational system, but we have to be aware of all the complex factors that influence our socialization patterns. For example, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a very traditional patriarchal society that, for example, observes women as uh, or young young girls as um, being focused, for example, on humanities and social sciences, not very focused on STEM, for example. And this is the perception that is uh, also being present in classrooms. So although all children have the same standpoint in the classrooms, if we have teachers who are preconceived about the ability of girls, for example, especially girls from disadvantaged families, then we are having this uh, achievement gap widening and widening. And there are also piece of results from Bosnia Herzegovina show there is a statistically significant difference between girls and boys in terms of their interest for uh, natural sciences, for example. And this is the result of preconception of teachers because if we have teachers who are socialized into patriarchal norms of behavior, then we have this great divide, especially when we're talking about children from disadvantaged groups. Thank you, Theana, for comment. Any other? I think that people will like to go on break. Yeah. I have a note to make. Okay. 
I come from an education faculty, so I teach the students they will become teachers, elementary teachers, and some of them high school teachers of social sciences. And I have to note that I, what I have observed that uh, very less is emphasized um, to the students who will become teachers in the future that, uh, that the, of the relation between the well-being, psychological well-being of the students and the relation of the, the, their uh, results in the school or their achievement in the school. Uh, we tend to emphasize, even the Albanian educational system tend to emphasize in the results or the measurable uh, outcomes of the students, what we can measure, so high points or high grades, not these hidden, let's say, factors that influence, of course. So when uh, our students go to school, they become part of this, let's say, tendency of the teachers only to see, to. Uh, let's say, emphasize or to look for the results in the students and not to see these, um, the psychological or emotional well-being of the students and even uh, of their self or of the colleagues that influences their motivation and everyday uh, frequentation or everyday ongoing profession. Thank you, Yolinda. Thank you for your comment. I think this is a very valuable comment because um, the, the, the teaching system, the universe, educational universities are not capacitated uh, to teach about, for example, empathy. Uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, on our educational uh, faculties, we do not have courses such as empathy. We do not, we are not talking about prejudices and biases. And if we do not talk about prejudices and biases, if we do not reflect on our own prejudices about disadvantaged children or groups of people in a certain society, we are not aware of it because the, the discrimination goes both ways. It can be explicit, uh, which is uh, legally prohibited, but it can be implicit. And sometimes uh, this implicit uh, discrimination is also, uh, we are not aware of it until somebody points to us and says, okay, maybe we are discriminating certain people because of this and this and this. And usually this has uh, been connected to previous patterns of socialization, as you could notice from the airport rush scenario, because we have been programmed to observe, for example, presidents of countries as men. And we have been programmed to observe, for example, neurosurgeons as men, or we have been programmed to observe teachers mostly as women, not as men, or special education uh, teachers, because the majority of special education teachers are women. So uh, their discrimination goes both ways. And this is very important to include on university programs and courses. Thank you, Yolinda. I, I think Lana had a question. Actually, no. question more like a comment because yesterday when we were talking about data I just want to kind of connect back to, 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 to yesterday's day and when Manas was talking about which data we collect and which data we use how little data we collect about the experience of students in school um, and this is something that we really need to push for I would say experience of teachers in schools as well and how they feel but primarily of course and always uh, because education is there for the students, uh, how they experience it. And about this idea that inclusion is a process. It's not only the end result of what we achieve in the end, but it's really about the process and how we need to push um, and look it for actually the data to be collected on the, on the, on the students and their uh, feelings in schools, which will tell us much more about how far we've gone uh, into inclusion. But luckily, you will have an option to, to listen to, to Ivona from Promente. Uh, within this program, we developed the questionnaires and the tools how to measure uh, school climate and the culture. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a pre, pre, pretty much good tool when we start working with, with other schools in, in our project and you can test it and you can contextualize it. So behind this, we also have that, that, that data that we personally believe that are really important in, in, in order to um, give good solutions and or to create strategies how to change your school climate and culture. But uh, at this moment, I would I would I would stop. We will have another another session uh, soon uh, because we are ten minutes late. Uh, I offer you two options to postpone the, the the break for the test ten minutes or to start on time as we planned on uh, agenda. Ah. Choices are always difficult. 
choices are always difficult. <laughs> on time. Okay, we have the first one first served. So we will start <laughs> at 11.30 uh, to continue this session on how to create mission and vision uh, according to, 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 to idea of good school, climate and culture. Thank you very much. Now you can turn off your cameras and take your break on. Thank you, Yasna, once more.